Hey everybody, time for another live stream. Uh, coming to you, beautiful Zhongshan, China. The summer's almost over. It's uh, late in August. I think it's the 24th, 25th around there. What is it? What day is it? You know, you lose track of 24, 24th of August. And it's about a little after 10 p.m. in Zhongshan. And uh, yeah, the the summer is just about over. I, I can feel it. It's not as hot outside as much. And I also noticed there's a lot more students going back to school. Uh, I don't think classes have started yet for the students, but I've noticed um, in and around the, uh, the schools, uh, a lot more students walking around in their uniforms, things like that. Uh, window into micro world. Hello, sir. Thank you for joining me. I saw you commented on a recent video. Thank you for that. Uh, I... Normally do not start, even though the university starts uh, in a couple of weeks, I normally do not start my classes until the second week of October. The reason for that is because uh, most of the students will have their military training. They have this mandatory military training, uh, all freshman students at university. It's kind of cool. It's really cool out there. They're marching around, you know, they're, they're getting some camaraderie. They're learning a lot of, of pretty cool skills. So, uh, that has all been apparently delayed or potentially delayed. I got a notice from the school saying um, you will probably uh, come back and start classes earlier than expected because they're postponing the military training. I haven't had any dates yet. Uh, so my plans, my travel plans for September have kind of gone out the window, unfortunately. Uh, I did have a long road trip planned with Mona. We were going to go to Guizhou and uh, do some hiking now they're telling me uh they're asking me they're not telling me they're they're suggesting that i do not leave the province because they want the beginning of the school term to be as clean as possible as far as the COVID outbreak everyone's still up you know have their guards up everywhere it seems to be under control i think yesterday they had like zero cases i think today they had like one case in the entire country uh here in Zhongshan, there are um Everything's open. Uh, everything reopened for a couple of weeks. We had no cases here, but almost like a show of solidarity to those areas of the country that that we're still kind of fighting it in a couple of areas that were in lockdown. Uh, very isolated incidents. Uh, the bars, the spas, uh, and the movie theaters all uh, were closed. Movie theaters were like only open like half. Uh, if you go to the McDonald's, you see that there's like one chair at each table. You know, so um, they were practicing or trying to enforce a lot of social distancing everywhere you go here in Guangdong uh, in public. You're required to wear a mask and show your green code. And the security guards are pretty, pretty strict on it. So uh, it's you know, go into any mall, you know, you know, even if you just step out for five minutes, you come right back in. You got to show the green code and uh, everyone seems to be complying and moving about to their lives very, very normally with just with these added precautions now there is one thing that happened uh hi uh we have agro agrofin is that how you say your name sorry about that and uh hamza ahmed i think i said that right thank you for joining me guys uh so this last week i uh had some uh, muscle spasms in my back this is something that i actually have been fighting my whole life it happens maybe once a year maybe once every other year uh my back will just tighten up you know and kind of do this a little bit and it's very very painful and then it lets go but i am sore and in pain and very stiff back for a couple days sometimes a week maybe two weeks so that happened to me last week and it was very painful <laughs> and uh, uh i was in bed all weekend uh, mona came and took care of me uh Normally, I would just go get some ibuprofen at the pharmacy and uh, do a lot of stretching, uh, do a little massage, mostly just rest. That's the best way to take care of this, right, in my experience. Uh, so I ran out of ibuprofen, so I said, okay, I'll just run down to the pharmacy and get some more, which is very common. Here in Zhongshan, all, the, all of the uh, ibuprofen painkillers and anything for, anything for pain and fever – is no longer being sold in the pharmacies. They're only being sold at the hospitals. It's part of their Zhongshan. Uh, it's part of the city uh, prevention. So if you have a fever or have any kind of pain, even if you have just mild headache or something, uh, you're supposed to go to the hospital 
to get those med medications. I think it's just a temporary thing, and it's only here in this city. Uh, in other cities, you can go into a pharmacy and buy painkiller, you know, ibuprofen, just for like a headache or mild aches and pains, very mild stuff. But uh, they also have their own kind of policies with regards to this. And uh, Mona went and uh, a friend of mine went and got some painkillers and they told me um, oh, they have to show their ID and to put it in a database and someone will call them to make sure that they're feeling okay. So they're on it. I mean, they're they're freaking on it. <laughs> but as of today, my back, it's still a little stiff, but um, not too much pain. I have those, those pads, those uh, medicated pads, the sticky pads that you put on your skin. It smelled terrible, the medicated smell. Uh, I've been wearing that for uh, a long time, last three days, really. So my uh, studio here just reeks of medicated pads and uh, it, it doesn't come out. And of course, you get like a little bit of glue residue that's stuck on your skin, a little bit left over. So uh, I am recovering and uh, I I was out a little bit today, walking around. I felt okay. There was, a, you know, I couldn't wait to come back and lie down. And then tomorrow, I'm filming um, uh, a a vlog that I've been working on for quite a while, and I'm very excited to do it about baseball in China. I'm a huge baseball fan, as you guys know. Go Dodgers! I'm a big Dodger fan. And tomorrow, uh, there's uh, I'm going to a big baseball stadium here in the city. And I'm gonna play some baseball with uh, some of the some of the kids. I'm gonna film it all and uh, talk about how this city is special in China, and that they call it an international baseball city within China because baseball is not a thing in this country, but in this city, it is a thing, and it's a big thing for primary school for kids, and it's also um, an area of the country where people come for the um, you know softball tournaments and things like this they have a pretty good baseball infrastructure in Dongshan and Shalan uh, also a lot of the uh, manufacturers in those towns also make sports gear for baseball there's some Taiwanese companies and some Korean companies and some Japanese companies that uh, that make various sports equipment for baseball so it's it's a big deal and i'm really excited to bring that to you because i love baseball so i'm gonna get to go play baseball and i did get to go hit some balls up in shallan at the batting cages too that was pretty great okay <laughs> uh yeah yeah i mean the whole world is still dealing with it man my, my best to you brother um yeah, america is not looking good either here in china they had like one case reported to the entire country and everyone's still you know, still up in arms, are still on high alert. No, of course it's not. It's just, uh, again, this doesn't happen very often to me. This only happens, the last time it happened was about 18 months ago. I remember it well. I was in the back of a, a DD car, and uh, I felt it as I climbed into the car. My, my back just kind of twisted wrong and kind of tensed up. And it usually is because I'm not exercising enough. Uh, or I'm under considerable stress for work or something, and then my body just says, up oh, now, gotcha. And I think that's what happened to me uh, a couple of days ago. It just kind of said, hey, you know, take it easy for a little while. And it's true, I haven't been exercising um, because of my foot, and now this. <laughs> I'm actually, I think I'm actually a pretty healthy guy. I do exercise a lot. My diet is getting better. It's, I'm always trying to eat healthy. Um, I'm, I'm pretty healthy, dude. It's just, uh, these little things that kind of put you out for, you know, we care and, and, and whatnot. So, okay. Um, quick question. Where did you meet Emma Stone? Oh, good question. Um, I met Emma Stone, uh, well over 10 years. It was a long time ago. Uh, she wouldn't remember me. I was working in a hotel. Um, I was, she was a frequent guest of the hotel I was working in, in Hollywood. And uh, I, at the time I, she had just made, I think the movie like easy a, I think that was the movie she made. And I didn't know who she was. I was like, I don't. Yeah, and, and I remember my, my, uh, the owner of the hotel, the boss was like, you know, you don't know who Emma Stone is. 
and you work here? I mean, he was like, and I was like, no, I never heard of her. I just thought she was just a, another guest that was in the hotel. I didn't think she, I didn't know she was someone famous, but uh, yeah, I had a couple of encounters with her uh, and uh, I felt, thought the world of her. I thought she was just the sweetest, fun loving. I mean, what she is in the movies, she really is that way in her life. She's just a sweet, fun loving, huge smile. Um, best friends of everyone remembers a lot of everyone's names very well. You know, it's just a down to earth. Uh, girl, but that was a long time ago. Um, she's just one of many that uh, I've met over the years. Great, great memories of my hotel days. Good question, though. Thank you. All right, let's get into some photos, and uh, because I got some things I want to share with y'all, and then after the photos, we'll go to the news. Okay, so uh, my Chinese classes continue. Uh, I am part, I'm now at HSK2, <laughs> and I know they're revamping it, but we're, we're working in the HSK2 book. Uh, I, I do about three to four hours of lessons every week. Someone commented recently, like, um, hey, uh, why don't you ever talk in Chinese to people in your videos? And I said, well, I talk to Chinese people in Chinese all the time. I have to. I live here. Uh, but uh, my channel is in English. It is my audience speaks English. And so I do speak Chinese occasionally in the videos, but that's not my, I'm not doing these videos to prove my Chinese abilities. Uh, my Chinese abilities are pretty poor compared to a lot of my colleagues and, um, and a lot of my friends in the YouTube community here as well. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, it's an ongoing process. Language acquisition is very hard for me. It always has been. And I spent a lot of time learning English and trying to become an English teacher. Uh, but I remember English was not easy for me to learn when I was younger, and neither was Spanish. So uh, learning Chinese, you can imagine, has been very difficult. But, you know, it's a grind. You know, I got my little notebook here. You know, I learn new phrases all the time. And I take this everywhere I go, you know. And, um, yeah, I practice I try to put little sentences together. Uh, for the most part, people understand me. Uh, now, Cantonese, however, uh, no way, I, I can't do it. And the people do speak a lot of Cantonese in in my city. Uh, it's definitely the local language, and um, it's it's too, too hard for me. <laughs> but uh, I can get away with China. I can live my life. Um, my reading skills have vastly improved to the point where now um, um, I feel pretty confident reading. You know wherever I go. I still have a lot of questions and I still use my translator occasionally to look up words, but everyone does. I mean, that's normal, right? Okay. Let's do, uh, this happened to my car. It's just this ugly scab on my bumper. I did it. My fault. Uh, I was backing out of a parking space and hit a little concrete pillar and uh, just a little scrape. Now, I put this on because I want to know, I, I got some um, a quote from the paint guy or the, you know, the, the body shop. And they said uh, it would be 500 RMB to fix this. 500 RMB is, what's that, like 80 bucks? Um, I think that's a good price. But I'm curious, how much would you pay in other countries to fix something like this? Please comment. Let me know. Um, I think 80 bucks to fix this is a decent deal. So uh, it's going to go in the shop. I have to go get an oil change and I have to do some other major work to it. But um, yeah, 80 bucks to fix this little scab. I think that's a good deal. What do you guys think? Let me know. Uh, where are you all hailing from? I know I got one guy from, uh, from Malaysia. Uh, burgers. New burger joint found in Sanxiang was recommended to me by a new friend of mine from Hong Kong. Uh, had eggs benedict at this place uh, i'm going to be including it in my next not my next one but uh, a food video in the near future my next food video will be about um, morning tea and cantonese food it's me a good one for all of you out there who love my food porn uh, but this is actually a chicken burger with uh, some cheese and i think that's a horse horseradish um, it came with a quesadilla and salsa and French fries and fantastic. Oh, so good. So more food porn for you guys out there. <laughs> um, I did 
show a couple of these photos in the past, but this is a project that I'm working on right now for the uh, ZT Classic Car Museum here in Zhongshan. This is a fairly new museum that just opened up. I'm walking distance from my studio here down by the river. <laughs> and down by the river, right? It's a, it's owned by a, a Hong Kong gentleman. Uh, and uh, basically, he and his family put this together after about 30, 40 years of collecting. And they got some amazing things. It's more than, excuse me, it's more than just cars at this place. It is history. And he was nice enough and gave me access to literally all of it. I mean, he said, Paul, have at it. So I spent two days filming uh, i'm not going to film the whole thing or show you the whole thing because i want you to when you come to Zhongshan to actually see it but i think it's going to be a winner of a video and it might even be two videos it might have to do a two-part series because i did film a lot but this one is of course the the firebird from the 1990s which is such a rare sight there's like only two of them in the entire country maybe a little bit more but wheels boy did a, a little drive of uh, of one of these in shanghai and uh, this is the other one, the only other one I've seen. It's got California plates on it. It's got a V6. It's not the V8, obviously, aftermarket wheels. Um, it's typical 90s GM product. It's kind of falling apart. But all of the vehicles in this museum are drivable. They're all in working order. Of course, the Harley. Yes, Harleys are a thing in China. There are Harley clubs all over the country. Packard, I think it's a 19, I'm going to say like a 1918, 1916 maybe. Now, I love this car because not only is it just a stunning good car, I mean, you don't see these cars on the road in China at all, uh, but this guy has like, gets special permission to drive these cars around. I mean, he's got, he, he'll drive them from Hong Kong to Beijing. He'll go to Shanghai, he'll, you know, he'll drive around Guangzhou in these suckers, you know. But uh, I remember when I was a kid, Growing up in Southern California, at the end of the block was a retired gentleman who had like two or three of these Packards. And he was such a nice guy. And all he did was work on the cars. He would wash them, clean them, work on them. And then he would give the local kids, uh, like they had prom or homecoming or something, he would show for them in these cars. And it was just a wonderful thing. And my next door neighbor had like an antique fire engine, a big one. And he would drive that around the town like at Christmas time and uh, do go and be in parades and everything. My father is a collector of Corvairs, <clears throat> but he also had like an old 60s uh, four-door Lincoln Continental at one point, you know. Um, he's had a couple of pretty amazing cars. So uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of classic cars. So this was just like amazing just to be able to walk around this place. Obviously an old Model T, uh, the owner, the guy who gave me access to this actually went to a uh, university in Malibu. So he was quite taken by the, uh, the beach culture of Southern California. And they have a shop here in town where they customize cars. Obviously, this is a, a mini, a mini Cooper that has been cut in half and made into like a a restaurant table and this is like an area of the of the museum that you can actually rent out it has a bar and you can have like a party or something here they got kinds of interesting things here they have a porsche 914 you know which is that volkswagen porsche a really really small one that um has a television screen in front of it and he actually installed like a playstation uh steering wheel and a shifter and everything you can play gran turismo while sitting in a 914 kids really dig that Pretty cool, pretty cool. This, I think I've shown pictures of this. This is a Toyota Serra from the 1990s. Uh, this is a special one. So this car, as you can see, the doors are these butterfly car, uh, doors. This car actually inspired the door design for the McLaren F1, and that's a true story. I mean, this is just a small little Toyota, you know, itty bitty car i mean it's like the size of a miata basically there's nothing special about it except for the doors so that's this car's claim to fame obviously and the fact that it inspired mclaren a little bit but it was only sold in japan and therefore it was only a uh, right hand side drive but look this one is a left hand side drive sarah 
And I had never seen one like this. I've never even heard of them. I didn't even know they existed, a left-handed side Sarah. So as far as I know, and I've done, I did some research on this. This is the only one I've been able to see. I'm sure there's other ones out there. But yeah, left-hand drive Sarah. How cool is that? And again, all of these cars you can drive out on the road. In fact, most of them are plated for China. So you can just drive them out of the museum and drive around. Of course, the Hongqi. Uh, this is the Hongqi uh, CA770. I think that's right. I can't remember exactly. But it was um, based on the platform is based on the old 60s Imperials. And a lot of them have, uh, these don't, but a lot of them have an old Ford big block or wide block uh, engine in them. And these things weigh like three tons. And there's two of them. They've got two of them here. And I got access to the whole thing. I could crawl inside and look around. Now, the interior of this car, you know, obviously, if you don't if you don't know, the Hongqi, here's a, here's a little story. When I was researching for this, I actually saw that uh, Jay Leno did a video on the Hongqi. Uh, similar, I think it was a little bit newer model than this one, but similar. And this was in like 2016, 2017. And he admitted, this is Jay Leno, that he had no idea about Trump Hongqi. He didn't even know it existed um, until he made this car. And that was 2016. This is Jay Leno. I mean, he's he's the guy who's like not only probably driven every car in existence, but actually is like an encyclopedia of, of cars. And so he was quite impressed with this one. And I was too. The, uh, the back, it's a limousine. And then they have these jump seats in front of you for the security guards. And this is what, you know, the dignitaries and the government officials and everything would be driven around in. Um, yeah, exactly. The Hong Chi was used by the uh, political mem political members. That's right. Oh, Snarky's on. Hey, buddy. Uh, miss you, dude. Hope you come back. I saw that you came back recently. Uh, looks like something Castro would write him. Yeah, probably. I mean, 1960s. You know, it's got that age to it, definitely. Here's the thing about it. When you sit in the back, it's, it's quite comfortable. Uh, it's got... It doesn't have power door, power windows. You know, you have to crank the windows. <laughs> um, the smell inside, obviously, these are used. It smells like a very old hotel room that has been smoked, cigarette smoked in for decades. It's a very distinct smell. It doesn't stink of cigarettes, but it's got this lingering combination of the smell of the old cigarettes and red wood, because everything inside is redwood, and it's in the fabric of the seats. And I, when I'm sitting in it, I felt like I was sitting in a in a very very old hotel that hadn't been up you know updated in decades. It was a very I know that smell. I've had that smell many many times living in China and throughout the world. Really, I mean, there was a hotel in San Francisco that I used to go to a lot called the Majestic. And it this old 1915, 1920s uh, building that was converted into a hotel. And the company I was working for at the time actually owned it. So I would go up there a lot for work. And I would stay in this old hotel with, you know, teak wood furnishings. And it had that, that, mm, that aroma. <laughs> but they had two of them. So uh, again, I'm going to film those as well. Very, very cool. This, of course, is the... Cadillac DeVille convertible. Of all the cars, uh, I asked him, um, the, the, the curator told me his favorite car was actually a uh, Triumph, an old Triumph. Uh, and that'll be in the vlog. I don't have a photo of it. But he said, of all the cars that he drives around China, this is the one that gets the most attention, this old uh, DeVille. I think 1966, I think it is. And... You know, I sat in it. I moved around. I opened up all the cupboards. I, I really just kind of looked all the, opened the trunk. Yes, you can fit six dead bodies in the back. I mean, it is just this massive boat. <laughs> and he says that the Chinese people really, really go crazy when they see this car out on the road because you don't, they don't see them. And back in the 60s, this was the pinnacle of luxury. I mean, it, yeah, outside of Rolls Royce, maybe Rolls Royce you know, cars like that. Cadillac was it. Cadillac, Lincoln, they, those were the ones. I mean, they, uh, 
BMW, Mercedes weren't on this, didn't have the the panache, if you will, that they have today. Uh, this was it. This is the one everyone wanted. And uh, I got some here. Uh, looks like the Batmobile. Sure, Batman did not drive it when he was around. It kind of, it kind of does, doesn't it? Yeah. This is a beautiful, beautiful car, man. And when you sit in it, it's a, it's a convertible. When you sit in it, you feel like you have just, it's just insanely. I've sat in convertibles like little small, like Miatas and Mustangs and stuff. That that doesn't have this feel. It feels like you're literally driving a boat. Yeah. Car looks like it go well with peanut butter and banana sandwich. That's an Elvis reference in case you missed it. Yes. In fact, uh, there's actually a, a, a cutout of Elvis Presley next to this Cadillac uh, in the museum. So definitely. <laughs> yes, Elvis is seen flipping burgers at the entrance to the Disneyland in Los Angeles. Ah, good fun, right? Behind it, you can see the Coca-Cola van. That's actually <clears throat> not a real bus, but it uses real hubcaps and windows and everything. It's just a, a snack bar kind of place. And then behind that, I don't have photos of it, is an old Willys Jeep, but it's one that was built by Ford. And I didn't know this, but uh, during the war, Willys couldn't produce enough Jeep. So actually Ford was making the Willys Jeep as well. So that's a a Ford Willys Jeep, and they got two BJ212 <clears throat> BJ Jeeps uh, next to that. Uh, one with all these weapons and everything on it, and then another one that's an amphibious boat, a couple of motorcycles. Behind this DeVille is a, ca a stretched Cadillac Fleetwood, uh, something you would see in old 1980s you know, Wall Street movies or commercials or anything in terrible condition but stretch limousine they also had a lincoln stretch lincoln there as well at two stretch there's one one stretch lincoln upstairs that's falling apart so pretty cool excuse me <clears throat> okay moving on from that um we talked about baseball tomorrow i'm gonna go play baseball with the kids very very excited I'm going to film it all. It's going to be great. And then um, I also, another big project that I'm working on. By the way, I just released the Lee River Resort Hotel. It's a short little five-minute video of the, the little resort that we stayed on, on the Lee River, maybe about a kilometer and a half, two kilometers from the town of Yangshuo. It's walkable. And pretty cool little hotel. You can check that out. But one of the new projects that I'm currently working on, the, the one I'm working on now, the one I'm editing right now, is actually on about uh, Dongfeng Motors. Uh, it's I did a little bit of history on Dongfeng. The, the car that I'm driving around is not a great car. And you'll see that. I, I, I kind of don't say too many nice things about it. But I do go into the history of Dongfeng Motors and the spiderweb of connections and partnerships that this gigantic company has uh, here in China. I didn't even know what Dongfeng Motors was until I came to China. <laughs> no, I doubt it. It's not, it's not a, it's not big. Again, it's more than just cars. They actually have a collection of everything. Um, they have a, they have an area where they've collected old irons, an area that they collected um, lamps. There's a Hollywood section where they collected old cameras and lighting fixtures from Hollywood. Uh, it's it's as if 30 years of an antique, you know, just spilled out. The, the presentation is really good, but there's just some unique things that you don't see in China. And there's another, there's a couple other classic car museums in China, but this is the first one that I've been to uh, here in South China. I think there might be one other one. Um, but there's, as far as classic car museums go, uh, my favorite one, obviously, the Peterson in Los Angeles. There's another one in the Valley. I can't remember his name. It's like Nascot, Nascot or Nascot or something. Uh, it's a huge warehouse filled with trains and cars and amazing stuff there. And you can get a tour of it. You just need a reservation for that one. This one is like something like 50 RMB. You can go walk around. And the curator's there and he'll tell you stories. They got an old Model T that is like a race car. 
that it was the first Model T race car. Oh, they have a Maserati. Uh, I can't, the name is escaping me. It got a couple Porsches, but they got a bunch of Rolls Royce. There's a Rolls Royce Silver Cloud in there, you know, a couple minis, but they got a, a Maserati there that is probably the only version of this Maserati in China, and it's freaking awesome. You know, I showed it in one of my car show videos. Uh, he had a little display at the car show, uh, and It'll be in the vlog. Again, I don't know how long this vlog is going to be, but it might have to be two of them. Mm -hmm. You know the Sultan. Ah, oh, okay. The Sultan bought a mock truck with a jacuzzi. It was worth about $1 million Malaysian, $1 million. Ring it. I know the Sultan of Brunei has probably one of the most amazing. I mean, they build cars just for him, like one of a kind cars. There's all kinds of videos about his his collection. The, my favorite collection so far. There's a couple of them. You look at um, Hoovy's Garage. I love that show. Hoovy's Garage is uh, is great. He's like friends with Doug Demuro, and uh, he just goes and buys like the cheapest version of X car, and then he fixes it up and sells it. But he's got this collection of of cars that i mean and he knows the history of it and he his thing is like how much is it going to cost to get this thing 100 percent running because he used to be a used car salesman Hoobie's garage is great the other one i like is of course jay leno's garage jay leno's collection i can watch jay leno's garage uh, i've been watching it since before he had like twenty thousand subs and before he was had the TV show on TV, you know, I, I've been a huge fan of Jay Leto my whole life. Um, and his collection is great because he'll buy like a, a 1994 whatever. That's nothing special, but he'll keep it. It's not the best version of a car of that model, but it's one and he just keeps it and he keeps it in as perfect and as you know, he'll keep scratches on it. If it gets scratched, he'll try just to keep the scratch on it. Um, he likes the old wear and tear of used cars, and I, I admire that about his collection. All right. Okay, the other project I'm working on is this. Lighting. I've done videos about Gujin, Zhongshan, uh, which is the lighting capital of the world. I mean, it's 70% of all the light, lighting fixtures, lighting products are manufactured and sold in Gujin, which is about 10 miles from here. It's a town on the west side of Zhongshan. I've done videos. I, When I first came to China, I lived in Shaolan, and many of my students were salespeople for, and, uh, for the lighting industry. It's huge. And half of the world's lighting is sourced from here. So if you go to a fancy five-star hotel, in India, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in the United States, and in, in throughout Europe and Russia, you know, wherever, they have these huge one-of-a-kind chandeliers and lighting, you know, fixtures that are designed and produced in Gujin, about ten miles from here. It is an amazing place to go and check out. Uh, I love the people there are really great. People that are very rich. <laughs> it's it's a it's such a huge industry. There are factories everywhere, but the showrooms are amazing. They have these gigantic picture the biggest mall you've ever seen, right? Been in. Now take out all the H and M and the McDonald's. Take all that out and put nothing but lighting showrooms, latest design showrooms for lights, ceiling lights, lamps, you know, table lights, outdoor lights. Uh, uh, parking lot lights, street lights, uh, you name every shape, size, color, um, design you can think of, it's there. And then times that by about five. And that's the town of Gujin. You walk down the street looking for a bank or a restaurant, you won't find one because everything is a lighting showroom. It's truly a remarkable area. And I'm doing a big video project on this to show all of you guys. This is me at the top of the tallest building in Zhongshan in the town of Gujin. It's the Westin Hotel. I did a video on the Westin Hotel when I stayed there. It's on my channel. And uh, the uh, 
the manager of the Liha Plaza, which is the giant mall there, uh, gave us access, me and the Zhongshan Foreign Advisory Council gave us all access to the roof, which is not open to the public. And it's like standing on top of the world when you're there. And that river behind that river, that's the town of, of uh, Jungmen. And behind me, that is the town of Gujin. Uh, truly remarkable. No, no safety whatsoever up there. <laughs> yeah. And that's looking back on um, South Zhongshan. This is a giant spire. It's the tallest building in the city. And it's sticking out of the, of the city. It, it, it's the it, there's no other tall buildings around. I mean, it's just this spear coming out of the road. And then down here, this is the high speed rail that takes you into Guangzhou. So you can go from directly from Guangzhou to this mall. You know, so you you're at the Canton Fair trying to source lights or something. You take straight to this mall, and you can source your lighting. Uh, remarkable infrastructure, remarkable uh, place. Lots of great things coming from this one. They tend to specialize in products allocated to each town in China, like Shantou is the lingerie capital. Of the world. Really? Where Victoria's Secret's manufacture the lingerie and whatnot. Shantou in Guangdong, is that right? Uh, Shantou, Guangdong. I'm actually thinking of going there in two weeks. You know, there's a um, to Shantou and Chaoshan area, right? Uh, if that's the one you're talking about. Now, Shaolan uh, is the town. Yeah, the Shaolan is the town next to it. It specializes in... Uh, like locking hardware, so door locks, safes, things like this, and also underwear. They also do underwear. Here in Zhongshan, we got a couple of major ones. Kaifa Chu is all high tech. Then uh, Gujin is all lighting. Uh, Ganko is like amusement park rides and also furniture. Then Shashi has the old traditional redwood furniture as well as garments. Uh, so yeah, it, it you're absolutely right. It's it's more integrated than it has been in the past, but yeah, each town kind of uh, specializes in one thing. It's designed that way to capitalize on uh, you know just supply chain management infrastructure as well as human capital that might be into that town. That's right, absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, Yes, it is my ancestral home. Very cool. Yeah, Chao Shan. I've been to Chao Shan, and I've been to Shanto. I actually, be between uh, uh, the three towns of Chao Shan, you know, uh, Shanto, I actually like the most. I, I I stayed there overnight and had a great time in that city. I love Chao Shan food. Uh, my Chinese doesn't work there because <laughs> you guys speak a completely different dialect. But there's an island that I want to go visit called, I think it's Naao Island just to the east of the city. There's a little bridge that take me over. So I'm thinking of going out there. It's either going to be back there or I'm going to go to Mao Ming and stay on the beach at a resort in Mao Ming. One last weekend before the... I can't, I'm can't. i not supposed to leave the, the province. Talk about that when we do the news. But one last weekend uh, before the term starts and I get busy again. So, God, the summer went by so fast. My friend, who is the largest lace manufacturer of lace in the world in Bangkok, they supply Chanteau with the lace. Yeah, they do a lot of, I mean, Guangdong has a lot of um, fabrics and, and things like that. Here in Sha and Shashi, they do a lot of that too. Here's a funny thing. I don't have a suit anymore. I used to have lots of suits. I only brought one suit with me to China, and I never wear it, of course, because in Guangdong... Nobody wears a suit, it seems, you know, it's too dang hot. But it's also like not the, I never see anyone wearing a suit. But Shashi makes customized suits. And so if I do want a suit, I just go down there and get one. Shanto is where the richest Chinese hail from the Wampao and the Hutchinson Chat. Chat. Is that right? Interesting. I know that part of China is pretty rich. You go up into Fujian and to, uh, uh, Meizhou, you know, you go to the old Hakka houses and everything in that area. A lot of those villages are pretty rich. I know that. Another place I need to uh, visit. Okay, Shingas from Shanta, also the 10 cent chop. <laughs> okay, great history on Shanta. I look forward to it, man. Okay, I'm, I'm slowly becoming convinced to go there instead of Mao Ming. 
Uh, Mao Ming is easier for me to get to. Shantou's a lot longer a drive. But uh, it has been about three or four years since I've been to Chaoshan. So, and I was there and the weather was not very great. And I was just in and out for maybe a day or two. So I really didn't give it the attention that I think it probably deserves. So yeah, uh, that could be uh, that could be it. More lighting fixtures. Okay, so I got access to not only the factories here and the factory lines where people are working, but I also got access to the showrooms. Now, when you walk into these showrooms, the salespeople will be happy to show you everything around, but they say no pictures, can't take pictures. Now, the the ones that they put in the front are kind of the the established designs, you know, the ones in the, you know, they're, everyone can take photos when you're walking around, right? But when you go into the showrooms, they say no pictures. And then they also have the VIP rooms, or they call it the money rooms, with the latest, not only the latest designs and technology behind lighting, because lighting is hugely technical these days, right? Smart rooms, smart lighting. The designs are integrated into the designs of the rooms themselves and the buildings. I mean, it's really remarkable that the high high tech aspect of all of this i got to go into some of these money rooms and i actually got to film some of it like here you know this is this light changes and dances with music not just the colors but the shape uh the walls open and close like a flower i mean it's just amazing incredible stuff this is one of the malls one this is the small mall this is the small one. There are two or three other ones that are bigger than this. This is called Star Alliance. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, it's like 12 stories. And on the top story, there is a restaurant. There is a uh, like a morning tea kind of restaurant. But as you can see, I mean, this escalator one goes up to the fifth floor, and then another one goes up to the 10th floor. This ball right here, this little ball right here, that weighs about two tons. <laughs> and the ceiling is a giant LED ceiling that changes and has different um, uh, different mo you know moods. There's like four different styles. They dim the lights. They play the light show there. Incredible. Over 400 businesses in this mall alone, 400 different showrooms. And we're talking showrooms that are 10, 20,000 square meters apiece. Insane. It's that big. And this is the small one. <laughs> here's an example of what one of the lighting showrooms look like i really like these areas again this is in the back this is not something that most people get to see i got special permission from all of the design studios that i visited i visited maybe 10 i got one more to go again this is a project i'm still filming i'm still working on uh, but it's not just the lights themselves. It's how it integrates with the artwork around it, the sculptures, the furniture settings, the technology. They'll have like little mock bedrooms, little mock living rooms where you sit down with a giant television projector television. And, you know, you talk to the wall and the wall changes the lighting mood. The, the entire room changes lights as you watch a movie. You've seen those TVs that like have a backlight. And so if you're watching something that has like a blue ocean, then the backlight will just turn blue around the TV. Well, imagine that happening with the whole room it just turns blue when you're it's it's an incredibly immersive uh, experience. And that's just one idea of all of this. It's really remarkable. Again, this is one of the um, showroom or the factories. These are motherboards that they are assembling by hand. Uh, there is some high-tech machinery that assembles the uh, the actual base of the motherboard. That's in a different room. That's in a clean room where you have to go get booted up and everything and get in there. Uh, I do have video of that. And then you, this is just one little production line where they're putting on these little semi, I guess, what are they? Little conductors or whatever. Um, notice that they're all women and they're all young women, fairly petite women. And, and uh, the men are all at the other end. The men are at the other end doing a different task. And it's because these pieces are so small 
and women have smaller hands. And so they're able to do a much better job of placing all of this together. Uh, you're right. A lot of this is done by robots. But this is not heavy manufacturing. This is light industry. Uh, and this particular, it's, it's a combination of computers and robotics and automation with hand-built. So these are partially assembled by hand, partially automated. And of course, in time, uh, they will start to automate this even more. But everything is inspected by hand. Uh, there are testers uh, at the end of the line. Uh, still in China, as, as much high-tech uh, manufacturing we have, and I'll show you, I went to the Galan's factory. It's all automated. I saw a lot of automation here in Gujin. It's still a common thing to see um, uh, assembly lines like this. Even at Galan's, mil building your microwaves uh, is all done by hand. You know, guys online, zip, zip. next, zip, zip. At one point, it becomes, it's a cost-benefit analysis. This particular uh, f manufacturing plant is very high-tech. This line is not, uh, but the other room that I come from has got all kinds of super, super high-tech gadgetry you know, and technicians on computers and everything. And it will be in the blog. I'll show you. It'll be there. All right. I think that's it. I think that's everything. Yeah, so here's the uh, particular line. The room back here, this is where all the automated motherboard stuff gets made. Very exciting video. Probably nobody will watch it. And you, you, know, you guys love my car videos, and I enjoy making car videos, and I enjoy talking about cars. Um, I recently made, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, the video I'm most proud of making ever was the uh, the bridge video. Uh, I uh, the Zhongshan Shenzhen Bridge Lincoln Tunnel. Uh, it's in my backyard. It's like 10 miles here. It's right on the coast. And it's a bridge that's linking the city of Zhongshan with the city of Shenzhen. And it's a 24 kilometer long link. And I spent years, literally years, getting the right permissions and organizing and trying to find the avenue to make that video a reality. And I put a lot of effort into it and I got maybe a thousand views. So there's that one. And then you work on another video that, you know, you film it in the morning, you edit it in the afternoon, you put it up and it gets 50,000 views. So it's, it's hard to, the ones that you put your heart and soul into and you really are proud of um, and you try to promote it as much as possible. They don't, they don't get the traction. And then you're surprised by the ones that do, you know, it's just like, I, you know, I did a tour of a bus museum and it got 60,000 views. Like, okay. A bus museum. <laughs> so who knew, right? Okay. So uh, let's go to the news. Shall we? Got some news to talk about. All right, right, so do they check concrete cancer from time to time on this automated as well? Like, the Dan's are checking using CCTV. I'm not sure what you're referring to. If you're if you're talking about infrastructure, yes, of course. They have engineers that check that stuff all the time. Okay, how about a little shameless self-promotion i'm still working with these guys fcustom.com if you want to go and get yourself some customized jerseys i have a couple of them myself my family all has them uh, i've sold a couple of these uh, all customizable for baseball basketball and football and now they have basketball shorts they have hoodies they have hats of course uh, check them out they're very very nice people and uh, you can hit the link below and enter the coupon code WalkaboutRoho for an additional 10% off your purchase. Help the channel out and get yourself a nice little gift. You can follow me on um, Facebook. Here I post photos. Uh, here's a little video here. Oh, I, uh, 
So here's a little video that of me going throughout the. Uh, this is the the lighting expo center. They actually filmed me walking around, um, filming this particular um, design studios. They just followed me around with a camera while I was filming it myself. So, and of course, I give photos of upcoming videos that are coming up so you can get a little sneak peek at what's going on. Wow. JW, thank you very much for your generosity. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, man. JW, um, who are you, man? Where are you from? That is an amazing donation. Incredible. Thank you very much. Zach Pizan, I'm doing okay, buddy. Thank you for asking, man. Do you ever get to do any um, mountain biking up there? <laughs> Your town? All right. Yes, very generous. Very generous. Thank you so much. Challenge you all. Top him. <laughs> let's let's have a challenge. Who can be more generous than JW today? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh hong is from canada great what part of canada you've told me once before maybe i think um eh. okay uh okay so that's that you can buy me a coffee if you'd like uh support me on patreon i do have a new patreon that came up thank you very much uh, i make 29 dollars a month on patreon again i don't ask for uh, donations uh the only compensation i get for these videos are from google adsense I do not do sponsored content. I know I get accused of that a lot. People often uh, accuse me of of uh, taking money to promote some kind of product or something like that. I never do that. All the hotels that I do stay in, I pay for. All the travel, I pay for. Uh, and people often will try to offer me money saying, hey, you know, will you promote this product on your channel? And I have to say no. Uh, I'll... I'll do a video about your product, but I own the content. I film it, edit it, own it 100%, and I own my opinion on it. And a lot of people say no to that. <clears throat> They'd rather pay me to control what I say about the content. And I won't do that. I, but you have my promise on that. So everything that I do and say in these videos is 100% me. Every hotel I stay in, I pay for. Now, they might give me an upgrade. Because I tell them I'm coming. So they might give me a suite. That happens all the time. But you know what? Even if I'm not filming it, they're going to give me a suite because I speak their language. Uh, I don't think I've ever gotten a free meal. You know? Um, that's not true. That's not true. I've been taken out to lunch a couple of times. That's okay, I think. I mean, uh, that's okay, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but it make it very clear that the only... Comp I, I lose money on this all the time. This is my hobby. I love doing this stuff. I, I kind of minored in film in at university. It was a big part of of growing up in LA. I have family in that industry. Uh, I wanted to be in that industry when I was younger, and so the ability to to make my silly little videos with my tiny little cameras and my tiny little computer over here, and then share it with all of you guys, that is awesome. But if you are thinking of giving money to a creator uh next time that thought comes in your head you know just think about me <laughs> okay uh okay uh jw says i says uh we were talking one time about my family in the jungman area i i got to jog my memory dude i <laughs> come for the stay for the car shows <laughs> Well, it's not only that. I mean, I, I do videos on the things I love. You know, I, I I love hamburgers. I love hotels. I enjoy cars. I love exploring. I love learning new things. So I love walking around. I love hiking. So I, and the car videos are obviously the ones that get the most views. But you see that I put out hotel videos just as frequently as I do car videos, even though they get one twentieth the attention as the car videos. I don't care. I. I'm going to continue to do what I love to do, and it's my channel. And, you know, you guys can give me some suggestions. I love that. I always take your suggestions in, in consideration. But, uh, you know, I have to be inspired. 
Jack says, had some fun times with some downhill guys recently. I can see you got yourself in the car niche. Enjoy all those videos. Pretty cool. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And you got a cool car too, by the way. My, uh, I've been doing car videos since forever, just walking around a car, you know, car shows. But uh, my friends have been like, hey, film my car, drive it around. And I'm like, okay. And they've been getting some good traction. In fact, they're the most popular videos on the channel, believe it or not, which surprises me. I'm working on one right now. So. Uh, you have a great wall. You have a way, right, Zach, if I'm not mistaken? And I love the ways. I'm thinking I'm looking into another great wall, a uh, Havel, to replace mine. Mine's old, but uh, I'm starting to think about replacing it probably in spring festival time. Yeah, it is better using the other means of payment as YouTube takes a 30% commission. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. You know, but you know what? They provide the platform and they provide the audience and they provide an awful lot of tools for creators for free. So, yeah, YouTube takes a big cut, but you know what? They kind of deserve it. They do an excellent job. YouTube's changed the world. You can try it and then take the sponsorship if it needs meets your standards. No, I won't do it. Um, I, I, if you do it once, um, let's say that uh, I do a video about a car. Um, so, for example, um, I went up to Hangzhou and spent some time with Jili. They invited me. And I went up there. I paid for the whole trip myself. Now, they gave me a, a Lincoln code to drive around for the weekend. They said, here, have this and tell us what you think. That was all they said. So I, I got a car to drive around and I made a video about it. But I was very honest. I, I enjoyed the car. It was a great car, but it was very honest. And it picked a lot of the things that did bother me with it. And they were very happy about that. They, they just opened the doors for me. To walk around. Same thing with Yutong. They did the same thing. They just opened the doors. And you'll be surprised how many people will not. I got, I'm got. i trying to get into this robo taxi company in Shenzhen right now. They're doing amazing things with robo taxi. And they're always sending me stuff like, hey, you know, maybe put this in your video. Maybe put this in your I'm like, no, I won't put your stuff in my video. But will you let me come and ride a robo taxi and let me film it? And they're like, no, we don't want you to do this. I was like, oh. It, you turn down so much. <laughs> okay, I kind of remember now. Yeah, that Weston is, is, I still haven't stayed there, but uh, only because I did a video on the Weston here in, in Zhongshan. So I've already done Weston. I try to do different, uh, different brands. I try not to stay in the same brand more than once. I want to experience all of them. So uh, I just did the Lee River Resort little boutique. Boutiques are great. Love boutiques. Uh, and my next hotel video after that will be the Safatel in Hangzhou. And then I got a little bit of the new Hangzhou Hotel, which is the oldest hotel in Hangzhou. Uh, and then I got two more hotels that I'm doing um, soon. Um, the W in Guangzhou. And then uh, the Wyndham in Mao Ming. Those are the two that I'm thinking of doing before classes start again. Come back, man. Come back. If you miss China, trust me, China misses you too. The way VV6, yeah. I like the poor. Yeah, the, 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 the poor is the pickup truck. Uh, it's a little too expensive. The newer one is the only one I would consider, and it's brand new. So on the used market, they haven't really come down in price to my price point yet. What I'm looking at is like a 2019, uh, 2020 H6. Uh, that's uh, Havel H6. I also like the F series from Havel, the F7, which is similar to the way. These are all pretty much the same. The VV6, I think, is the same thing as the H6, only it's kind of got that F series body. Um Way makes great cars. They had the Way Tank, and then Tank became its own brand. Uh, the Tank is awesome. The Way 300, I think that's the one you're talking about. Uh, again, a little bit out of my price range. Uh, I'm paying all cash for this. I'm a poor teacher, guys, and I spend a lot of my money on traveling. So um, saving for a car is not a priority. That's why I drive a 10-year-old uh, Havel, which I love, but I love my car. It's a great car, man, but 
even I know, yeah, after 10 years, it's time to upgrade a little bit, just get something a little bit newer. I, I drive my girlfriend's Corolla, which is a 2020 Corolla. I think it's 2020. And it's got that little Corolla has lane keep assist, adaptive cruise. It's got all the gadgetry inside and a tiny little package. And it's such a joy and an ease to drive on the highway. Whereas mine, you know, going up a steep hill, I got to rev it. I got to get some engine. Going. I got to turn off the AC sometimes, you know, it's got a, it's just too heavy with a tiny little engine and it's 10 year old technology. I don't even have cruise control on this thing, man. So, uh, yeah, my old ass is feeling that I need something a little bit easier to drive perhaps. So I am saving up for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hotel nerd. I love staying in hotels. I like camping too. Don't get me wrong. And, I, and I'll sleep in my car. But uh, if I spend one night freezing my butt off in the back seat of my car, then I'm going to spend the next night in a five star hotel with a nice, great big hot shower and a soft bed. <laughs> okay, let's go to the news. First thing I want to point out is this. This is the party of the year. This is the Dongguan Here Magazine. It's a Here Magazine pool party in Dongguan. It's happening September 4th at the Tanglang Dongguan Hotel. This is the old Sofitel in Dongguan. It's the same place it was last year. It's the same party as it was last year. I put a little bit of it in one of my China Randoms uh, videos. I am thinking this year I'm, I'm going to stay the night there again. I got a great room overlooking the lake. And I think that... Um, uh, I will be trying to do a live stream from the party. I mean, last time I just did, did some videos. I mean, I I was enjoying the party. I was rocking out at the with the concert. I was eating tons of food. I retired to the room, take a little afternoon nap, came back and partied some more. And then after the bands were done, I went swimming after many many beers. <laughs> <clears throat> but Ziv Ziv uh, is the guy who runs this thing. It is the party of the year in Guangdong, and I will be there. Uh, I think Mona is going to be able to coming with, coming with me, and we're just going to have a good time. We're going to eat, we're going to drink, we're going to rock out. We're going to have a lot of fun, and I hope to do a live stream while I'm at this one. Uh, very very eclectic group of people who come to this this party. Incredible people watching from all walks of life and very international crowd. Uh, as well as all the locals that come. The, the music is great. Again, the, the food is fantastic. You have International Food Street with Mexican burritos and Italian. Uh, yeah, it's just so good. So that's coming up September 4th, Saturday. Uh, if you are in Guangdong, check it out. Come party with us. Uh, I'm going to be there. Uh, I think Fermube will be there maybe because he lives in Dongguan. Ziv will be there most definitely. We're going to try and get some other people from the YouTube community is there as well from Shenzhen, from Guangzhou, from all around Guangdong and uh, come have a blowout of a good time before we all have to go back to work and the term starts. <laughs> so be on the lookout for that guys. The largest scale worldwide. Will Universal Beijing amaze us? I had plans to go to Universal Studios in Beijing this summer. It was supposed to be my birthday present to myself. I thought it was going to open this summer. It didn't because of COVID kind of raised its ugly head again this summer and kind of put damper on that. So they continued to do like a soft opening there. And it's supposed to be the largest theme park in the world. And when it opens, I will fly to Beijing and spend a day at Universal just for this park. I am that much of a theme park nerd. Yeah, you know, I grew up next to Disneyland, going to Knott's Berry Farm, Universal Studios in Los Angeles, SeaWorld in San Diego, Six Flags, you name it. I love roller coasters, I love theme parks, and I'm very excited for this one. Uh, when the term starts, I will, won't have a whole lot of time to do things like this, but I will make the time, even if I have to fly up, you know, to a red eye, go to the park, then fly back the next day. I'll do it. I will do it. So it looks very, very cool. They're going to have uh, all kinds of amazing things. Very excited. Yeah, the Wizarding World. 
which I haven't seen, by the way. I've been to the Universal in Singapore. I have a very old video on my channel about me in Singapore going to Universal, very small Universal. It was not that crazy about it. They had some good stuff there. But of course, nothing beats the Universal in LA with the Backlot Tour. He's an engineer on the product. Very cool. All right. Very cool. Yeah, it's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. And Legoland is opening in both Shenzhen and in Shanghai. If you have kids, I know Legoland's big with the kiddies. All right, let's talk about um, this. Collapse of China's online touring takes American teachers down. Not just American teachers, but teachers around the world who make a living teaching online to children. It's gone. It's done. It's over with. <clears throat> It's ending. I know some online platforms are trying to uh, change their, you know, they relaunch their brands and relaunch their positioning, try to get around the new laws. But this has really hit the whole industry of online teaching, which I've never been a part of. I've talked about getting involved in it as kind of a part time thing in my spare time, whatever that is. And it never happened. And uh, it's a good thing. I actually have friends of mine here in town who teach online and they've lost their jobs. And you know they're on spousal visas, and so technically they're not supposed to work. And in addition to that, the training centers have been closing because of the new laws or the anticipation of the new laws coming into, into, into effect. There's no more investment coming into the industry. Uh, a lot of the companies that have good financial backing are going to try and weather the storm and reposition their their place in the market instead of being English training or math training. They're they're trying to you know, test the waters and being like a whole person education group or something like that. It's going to be interesting how this all kind of finds its equilibrium. But for now, it's all in chaos. And um, don't worry, the, the those who those who had jobs in the training centers uh, can very easily and they lose lost their job here in China can very easily go out and find a legit job because private kindergartens are still hiring. There's there's a huge shortage of teachers. And so there's plenty of jobs to be had if you're a legal teacher. But the days of uh, coming here on a tourist visa and doing visa runs and working under the table, that's been over for a long time and it ain't coming back. So um, there is a huge demand for it. Now online teaching, if you live in China, um, they're trying, think they're talking about they haven't made it a thing yet but opening up the floodgates if you uh are a teacher in china legally then you will be able to teach online i've read about this i don't think it's legal yet in fact, i'm pretty sure it's not legal yet but they are advertising and looking for teachers madly term starts soon we'll see how it is all the children that i have talked to all the like middle schoolers and high schoolers here in the town that are like kids of friends of mine and things like this i always ask them what do you think what do you think uh, about this? They all love it. They're like, finally, I get a break. And their parents are like, I don't like this. I don't like this. You know, my kid needs to study seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Otherwise, he's not going to make it. And the kids are like, I just want to go play basketball, man. <laughs> it's summer. Let me go play basketball. So the kids are actually very happy about this development. And the rest of the adult world is just trying to figure out what to do. And it is creating a black market underground market of tutoring um i have been approached countless times just not just this summer but over the last maybe two years hey can you teach my kid hey can you tutor my child and i don't teach children i i just not what i do you know i teach at the university i teach that age so i won't teach at a kindergarten or anything like that but the demand is so big and i've seen the uh advertisements for uh teachers throughout Guangdong, a uh, place like Dongguan and uh, Foshan and Guangzhou. And to teach at a kindergarten is big bucks now. If you're a kindergarten teacher, you're making you're making buku bucks. You're making a hell of a lot more than I do. So who, who knew, right? And yeah, Jamaica's on. Hey, Gene, good to see you. Yes, Wall Street English is done, declares bankruptcy. Now, this a lot of people have been saying that this is a sign of the times and that this is, I mean, Web International closed what, a couple of years ago. Um, but there were some funky things going on financially with this company. They incurred huge debts when they were bought out by a private investment company. And then they paid huge fines on top of that for shady business practices. And then apparently the owner 
you know, took a ton of cash and, and, you know, took off to England. And uh, so this is just Wall Street English in China. The Wall Street English brand is, is something you see throughout the world. They've got a huge footprint of English training in many, many countries. So, um, but the Wall Street English in China is done. Zach says we are done too. We're part of yeah. If you if you're if you own if you own a training center, uh, you're done. And um, this was a a loophole where if you were the owner of a of a training center, you could teach legally. Uh, but you couldn't be hired as a native speaker. So now a lot of these guys who had training centers, they're struggling to find legitimate jobs. There's plenty of jobs to be had. You, if you look around, there are jobs to go get. You just uh, everything's in flux. People are not a big uh, fan of change in this world. Teaching kindergarten is training. You earn every dollar. Yeah, I'm sure. Man. <laughs> I got a good friend of mine here in town who's been in kindergarten. He loves it. He's an older gentleman, and I don't know how he has the energy to do it, but he does it, and he loves it. He says those kids keep him young. I wouldn't be able to do it. No way. Yep. Yeah, web web kind of got messed up. That was a big problem. It is a problem, and it's not just in training centers. It's in a lot of places. Here's another thing I'll say about this. Uh, this happens a lot, too. Uh gymnasiums will open up, they'll sell a bunch of, of memberships and then take off with the cash and close down and not give the money back. Uh, this is happening a lot more because of COVID. A lot of uh, these companies are using COVID as an excuse to shut down operations and you know, basically scale back What's problem? Hotels are doing it too. They're shutting down amenities and facilities, blaming COVID for it. When in reality, it has nothing to do with that. It's just cost savings and maintaining margins, uh, and running off with cash. It's a cash grab, and it's not just in China. It's all around the world. This is happening. So you have to really kind of look at it. Is it a sign that the industry itself is collapsing, or is it a sign that individual companies are taking advantage of? the situation in order to maximize their profitability and their margins. Probably both are going happening, but a lot of people just look at it as, you know, cause and reaction, but it's a lot more nuanced than that, I think. Yeah. Okay. So that was that. Um, I have some interior design ones. There was one, not this one. I'll finish off with this, guys, and I'll call it a night. I've been on for a while. Uh, this one caught my eye because it's a, uh, a color scheme and a design theme that is similar to my studio, the way I designed mine, which is this light natural wood color and uh, with grays, with dark grays. So I really, really liked this uh, this interior design. Uh, I mine's wallpapered with uh, the interior design of mine is wallpapered with with wood accents. Uh, this one also has a concrete floor, which I, I dig the minimalism of it, or the tile floor, but concrete colored, I guess. Love it. Kitchen. I'm not a fan of the different style chairs, but I love the chairs individually, especially this one here. The contrast is great. Man, this is not a new apartment. This is an older apartment that's been redone. Again, you have the return. Here that kind of flows into the dining room. This is the common trend we're seeing now in open kitchens. They'll tear down a wall. They'll put a return kind of kitchen. I don't want to say kitchen. What do you call it? Like a countertop. And then that moves into the dining room area. And uh, a couple of bar stools. Look at that. Very cool. Big comfy sofa. Fat rolls. Integrated with the TV. I just love this. This is perfect. No, I, I, this is how I would design my house, just like this. Maybe not the art. The artwork's a little pasteled. It's not for me. And I hate that chandelier. I've seen this chair, this little floor chair, and a lot of. I, I hate it. I think it's just this ugly little freaking blob in the corner. But I like this other one over here. Let's see the bedroom, hallway. Yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty decent. This, I mean, these are these are taking standard 
uh, apartment rooms, apartments, uh, two, three bedroom apartments you would find in any any city in China. They're all the same. And then trying to create something unique and interesting in the interior. That chair just looks horribly uncomfortable. But I dig the design. That's kind of cool. I'll make up a counter for the ladies. I'm not a fan of these like little hallway desk areas. I just don't get it. I, hmm. This shower design, I think you get this at Ikea. <laughs> I've seen that a few times. Children's room. Same bookshelf. Okay. Okay. That being said, okay, come up with some last minute uh, comments here and then uh, call it a night. Again, JW, thank you for your generosity again. That was very, very awesome. I appreciate it a lot, man. I, I will do something nice with that, I promise. Um, It'll buy me many cups of coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> gyms have been um, a perennial problem and not sustainable. It is like the home gym's equipment. After three months, nobody uses their gym as it requires discipline. That's true. Yeah, I see a lot of home. I thought about buying like a used treadmill or something, but I probably would never use it. Every house I go to that has a treadmill, it's being used as like, an area to dry your clothes. <laughs> uh, but gyms are growing. My gym here is a wonderful gym here at the mall that I live at. And there's new gyms opening up and they fitness is becoming a huge deal. It's part of the um, video that I'm filming tomorrow about baseball, about the growing sports industry. Uh, it continues to grow. And baseball seems to be a huge potential market as a baseball fan. And uh, my town, Zhongshan, is investing heavily in this. Uh, so um, I'm welcome. I'm going to go check it out. So it, it goes along with fitness becoming a very important part of society and uh, the culture here. And you see it a lot. A lot more people are hiking and doing outdoorsy stuff. Uh, a lot more people are taking swimming lessons, things like that. I really don't want to go back to kindergarten, but I might have to do it. As a stepping stone, it's great to downgrade from my own school. I don't know, work for someone again. That's grim. Yeah. It's tough to have a you know, have a boss again. Burgers and beers. Do that, man. Burgers and beers. Up north, that would be great, even in the wintertime, right? Again, yes. JW, thank you. You're awesome. I appreciate it. The Olympics have just finished and inspired some people. Yes, the Olympics were huge. I didn't even watch them, really. But, yeah, a lot of people love the Olympics. They, they were watching it on their phone everywhere I went. People were watching the Olympics on their phone. Okay, with that, guys, I need to end this and uh, call it a night. Thank you all for joining me. It's well over an hour. Those are my limit for the live streams. Uh, oh, Dad, I saw you were on here. Of course. Are you going to Mexico? Are you going out to Coronado for that? Uh, God. Great memories. You gotta, and I'm sure you're gonna be serving up that tuna at the party. Again, I'm sorry I can't be there for the party. I love you guys. I'm gonna miss you guys. But uh, during the party, uh, I will be uh, traveling. I'm going to be on a beach somewhere. I don't know which one yet, <laughs> but that's my last weekend of of you know to let loose a little bit. I'll be somewhere in Guangdong. And I hope to do some kind of live stream for the party and uh, wish you guys the best. So, uh, I, uh, I've i been telling my my friends here and showing them pictures of Catalina and all the fun and the scuba diving and all that. And they were like, ah, I didn't even know that was off the coast of L.A. I'm like, yeah, they got paradise off the coast of L.A. You got to go check it out. There's a uh, there's a place near Mao Ming, uh, that uh, it's an island that's famous for scuba diving. And in my city, I was just found out that there's a scuba diving club. Uh, I have a friend of mine who sings at the bar down the street, and she is a big scuba diver. And, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, going out on the boat and doing some diving because there are many places out in the Zhuhai Islands and out near Mao Ming and Yangjiao, uh, Yangjiang for this. So we're looking for um, 
some excitement. I found a place to go sailing. I found a place to go surfing all here in Guangdong. I don't have to go to Sanya and Hainan to do that. So more adventures coming up in the future, guys. Just have to um, just have to find the time and get out there and then share it with all of you. So um, I got to get off. I got to get off because I'm going to go play baseball in the morning. So thank you all. Go Dodgers. Uh, September's coming up. The pennant race is on. It's going to be an awesome pennant race to the end against our nemesis, the San Francisco Giants, which is a, they have a great team. So I think that this year is going to be a race to the finish and into the playoffs in October. And uh, I can't wait. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, guys, take care, everybody. We'll see you on the next one. Bye.